Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Movie Club. We were on hiatus for a few weeks. Uh, of course, you guys remember I had a, I'm John Campy, by the way, I'm your host. Uh, I had a, a family emergency up in Canada I had to go to. And then when I got back, Rob got COVID. So he was out for a couple weeks, but we are back now. And we are here to cover part three of our Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yep. Today we are talking about Lord of the Rings Return of the King. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find many people who wouldn't acknowledge it is one of the greatest films of all time. Of course, I say it all the time, but no film in cinematic history has ever won more Academy Awards than Lord of the Rings Return of the King. It won 11. Most importantly, it did something no other film has ever done. It was nominated for 11 and it won 11. It completely swept. It was the culmination of one of the, I, to me, other than st the original Star Wars, other than that, the greatest trilogy of all time. I'm joined here today to talk about Lord of the Rings, Return of the King with Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing? John, it's good to be here to talk about this film. Uh, I, I think a triumph of fantasy filmmaking. Still, of course, one of the best movies ever made and what's not to love. Right beside him, of course, is Ray Orr, of course, a Tolkien historian. Yeah, uh, this <laughs> is like the Return of the King. It's like the Return of the Club. The Return of the Club. The Return of the Club. Right? Now somebody's going to be making that poster, the Return of the Club <laughs> poster. Anyway, guys, here's basically how Movie Club goes. And we now call this meeting to order, by the way. Uh, we're going to discuss our thoughts on the movie here for a little bit. And for the first half, then in the second half, we're going to take your live thoughts, observations, theories, you know, whatever things you have just fire in, go ahead and you can use the super chat feature for that. We'll do that for the second half of the show. So let's get things started here. Uh, right off the beginning of this movie, they did something really brilliant and really quick. They gave us Smeagol Gollum's origin story in a quick, like two to three minute scene that told the whole, everything we needed to know about Smeagol. By the way, I love this shot. The way he would look at this little worm. It was like it was like the craziest thing. Of course, they actually got Andy Serkis uh, to play the part and how quickly the ring took him, murdered his own friend, cast out. And then they did that really cool thing where a little bit over time, you saw how the ring was degrading him, I guess. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that was just such a great way to start the whole thing. Well, you know, it was a great conceit, like... Fellowship begins with the flashback that sets up the beginning of the, the end of the, the, end second, of the second age, age yeah. beginning of the first age, you know, the war, the first war of the ring. And then you do the flashback to the battle with the Balrog in two towers it, to see then what happened. Can, after yeah. That. And yeah. then this did the same kind of thing. And I know that this wasn't necessarily the way the movie was originally going to start. And I thought this was a great, great way to begin the movie because it's giving you backstory that you don't have. So you're immediately... Like you, you even forget about what happened at the end of Two Towers. You're like, oh, I'm almost like in a new movie, and yeah. it, 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 you're completely immersed in it. And then you, in right after this, it goes out in the extended version. You go to Isengard and you see the aftermath. You see them confront Saruman. What, what, what did, what did Pip call him? The tree beard is taken over. Not stewardship of Isengard, but basically he's he's now kind of running things here <laughs> right. in Isengard. I, I gotta say with uh, Smeagol, I kind of get it now because like usually in most stories, it's like the handsome, and then they get something and it corrupts them, and then they're ugly. He went from ugly to ugly. <laughs> He's, if you go back to that Are shot, you being he's like, here, I'm right? just saying. I they mean, did not make it. Frodo's yeah, a good looking look hobbit. Good. Yeah, you know, for even Sam, Sam, Samwise. He's, sure, he's a good looking hobbit. But look at that. And Andy Circus is a good looking. He's guy. a good looking guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Andy Circus. No, up, no, yeah. but but this hobbit, he he had a tough life. It looked like it looks like. <laughs> Smeagol and Deagle, not exactly your matinee idols. No, but but here's the thing too, I remember the first time. Not the first time, but the first time I watched this thing at home, right? It struck me. There are a lot of people who will say, you know, the real hero of the Lord of the Rings story is actually Samwise Gamgee. And, and, and there's a discussion to be had there about that. Sure. In a way, I don't think you're far off to say that the story of Lord of the Rings is kind of the story of Gollum. Like when you go all the way back into the Hobbit, and who would have ever thought, like if you read the Hobbit first, that, oh, this little character who had the battle of the riddles in the dark with, with Bilbo Baggins, that he would become such a central figure because he was the one who held the ring for however many centuries. He's the one who held the ring. It destroyed him. It corrupted him. 
He became the walking manifestation of what Frodo was in danger of becoming, but also the way he then came back to the ring with Frodo and Samwise, loved them, hated them, led them to Sheep sh she Shelob, or she Shelob. She Shelob. Shelob, led them to Shelob, and eventually the movie really climaxes with a, a battle between Frodo and and Gollum in that cave and. The tragedy, you know, it's I there's a part of your heart that breaks at the end of this with Gollum as he's falls into the into Mount Doom. Uh -oh. And, and <laughs> but the look at his face. All he cared about was that's how much the ring owned him. Yeah. That even as he was falling to his death, ah, he was just so happy he had the he ring. He died back happy in his hand. though. He, but he, he died, died happy. He died happy. He died. He achieved that again. He got back his precious and, you know, in a way. His his the, his happiness in death was the freedom that Middle Earth needed, <laughs> the liberation. <laughs> I mean, we were liberated from Sauron because because Gollum is happy again. I don't know what what are some things. Let's just talk in general here for a couple of minutes, Ray. When when you look at the movie now, what are some of the things? Because you just rewatched it again, right. but what are some of the things of the movie that really stood out to you? I, I'm telling you, from the first one to this last one, I am amazed at some of the effects there. I can't believe it. Like I was watching it on HBO Max, right? So I was on, and like some of the shots of uh, Gollum, I was like, that looks so like it's right there. Like right, yeah. I mean, I'm just amazed by all the effects. Like some of it, it still stands till this day. Yeah, right like now. decades it, later, it's, it's even better it than some up. things that we we've seen lately. Um, just the whole lore, like the whole like the costumes. Oh. Like, like just the settings, everything you could, you could tell like the, the mood in a place just by their surroundings. Yep. Right. Like when they're, that's why they're, I won all those artistic awards too, like costuming yeah. and set design. I, I, and I, I can't believe this gold mine that we were given in the 2000 year, 2000, this thing was, I appreciate so much more now than back then because I watched them and I was like, everyone else is watching them. They're really popular, you know, like, but I just right now too. you. Rob's got Aomir right here on his uh, <laughs> on, on his desk right here in front there of him. He there he is. <laughs> there he is. From the Riders of Rohan. The butcher. Yeah, that That's Billy Aomir. Butcher was. That is him. Yeah, oh, yeah man. He Call lived, Urban. right? I do not doubt his heart. He, he stayed alive Just through the, the whole thing, right? his arm. <laughs> What's that? He, he stayed alive through the whole thing, right? He yeah, lived. Yeah. yeah. He oh, lived yeah. Right that there. is him. Wow, what a young Billy Butcher. Yeah, <laughs> that one, right? Man, he's so baby-faced in there. Oh, he's, yeah. He's one of the knights, right? One of the... Well, he's one of the Riders of Rohan. Right. He got introduced to him in the second film because he's you know one of the writers of rohan who went, they come across in the second film when they come across uh legolas and and uh strider and gimli running across the plains and he says i would cut off your head dwarf mm. if it stood a little higher <laughs> i mean that that was him but yeah so he's one of the heroes of the film I, well, yeah yeah and one last thing i really enjoyed was the scope of like the wars when you would look far ahead oh, yeah. and you Still see that I've never seen anything like those it. monster elephants, whatever they were called, the elephants, Elef yeah. all of those Elephants. things are crazy. <laughs> that looking at those things, it's terrifying. And I loved that whole scene right there. That's probably it. Well, those I mean, were, like, we came out of the second film, Rob, having just watched the battle of Helm's deep to which all of us at the time thought, We've never seen anything like that. Like, you got to guys remember at the time. But I would dare say we had still never to this day seen anything like that until we got into Lord of the Rings when we got to the Battle of Osgiliath and... Pelennor Fields. And Pelennor Fields. And that somehow, some way, they found a way to top what they did at the Battle of Helm's Deep. They even replicated some things. Like, for instance, in the Battle of Helm's Deep, when I can't remember which day Gandalf says, he says, on, on the second day or the third day, look to the east or whatever. And sure enough, as the dawn is breaking over the battle at Helm's Deep, here comes Gandalf with Eomir, who yeah. brought the, the, the outcasted riders of Rohan down. Then they kind of do it again when, you know, you have King Theoden show up. And that I'll never forget sitting in a theater and I still get chills today when I see it. When you realize Theoden has showed up and the camera then goes up and then starts to pull back and you see the legions of the horse lords that have come with them. You're just like, and like the scale of it. Oh, was yeah. Like, like to this day, Ray, you're seeing a bunch of the effects still hold up today. Shots like that, battles like that. 
No movie has and ever. There's what, a great shot of it right there. Right. You know no what, movie has ever replicated that since. No, and I think one of the things that one of the the secret weapons that and Peter Jackson was so smart hiring people like Alan Lee uh, and John Howe, who were famous Tolkien illustrators, and those illustrators because they had drawn and painted many pictures and illustrations over the years of Tolkien stuff, but the the quality of the light and the, the oh. there, there's a fairy tale aspect to this that I think it was really smart to bring them on to bring this painterly illustrative quality to the whole look of everything. You see it in Rivendell, you know, you see it in, in and, and it, it is otherworldly. This does not look like, Oh, they went and shot it in the woods somewhere. Yeah. You know, I mean, they did do that, you know, in New Zealand, they have real landscapes, but the 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 quality of this the 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 look of it i think that is it's unsung in terms of the you call it when i say verisimilitude there's also verisimilitude within a world it doesn't have to look realistic like our world but the look of this film and i think this movie the 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 look of it has changed when you go to fellowship there's this lush green quality to it it is in there in the shire and it's there at the end when boromir sacrifices himself yeah there's a there's a a, a, a foresty quality to it this has that expansive i mean we're basically on the end of the world here yep. this is this is mordor's on the other side you know the the white city is on this side this is where the world is either going to be saved or ends. And you 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 have that feeling. I mean, look at it. This just these these images are they're straight out of a dream. I mean, look at the look at the the battlements and how they're being attacked like they were on Helm's Deep, but these things are much bigger. And you've got the Gron, the big, the big burning thing they're gonna smash. They're oh gonna yeah, oh, smash. they're battering they're like, ram. Grand, grand. And they're I mean, this is just it's amazing. And the monster trolls, I'm I'm saying, okay, we had the infinity infinity war war and then the end game war they they can't touch this no they, no they, they don't they, touch no, world they were, of warcraft they don't touch this they they drew a lot of their inspiration i think from this yeah but you you can't you just can't replicate this you you just can't and listen so that reminds me so we talked a little bit about about Gollum and stuff like that we talked about samwise and you know through i want to propose also that king theoden is now granted he wasn't there in the first film no but once he arrives in the trilogy in the second film he becomes such a key central figure and i propose was given all the best lines um of of the movies because first of all the battle of pelinor fields right just as he goes death right now like that whole <laughs> speech he gives is just insane you guys know i think one of the greatest lines in cinematic history, you all know what I'm going to say. It is not just in any fantasy film, Lord of the Rings. One of the greatest lines in cinematic history. Where they've already established that Theoden's a little pissed that Gondor never came to help them. Right. When they needed them, right? But then Aragorn comes running in. The sacred pact of the, the beacons have been lit. He runs and says, the beacons have been lit. Gondor calls for aid. Theoden ain't happy about it for a second. <laughs> But then he says the greatest mm -hmm. line in cinematic history, and Rohan will answer. Oh, that's a man. <laughs> that is a man. And <laughs> Rohan shall answer. And then he says one of the other greatest lines in cinematic history. They're at the encampment, heading off to Gondor, getting ready to try to help Gondor in their fight against Mordor. And one of his, his lieutenants and generals come to him and says, we do not have enough men. We cannot defeat Mordor with 6,000 men. And basically he says, no, we can't. Then he says the line, but we shall meet them in battle nonetheless. Girl, that's a man. <laughs> that is a man's man. <laughs> what right he said there. after that, but I won't be there. Y'all can yeah, go. But I won't be there. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> uh, you know, Theoden is a man. One of the great things, too, about this entire trilogy, but never more so than in this film, is how all of these storylines are interwoven. You've yes. got you've got the Sam and Gollum and and Frodo going marching to Mordor through the sludge storyline. And that's kind of unto itself. Then you've got you've got Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, and they've kind of been moving through. And and then you also have Denethor, you know, oh, and, I and, love and Denethor. Mary, you know, in the White City. And there's all of these narrative threads 
that are being pulled tighter and tighter mm -hmm. and tighter. And all of our characters are being drawn into this final maelstrom that's really the battle. It's the most apocalyptic. What's the actor's name? John, John, who plays Denethor? Uh, John Noble. John, John Noble, Noble, thank you. I, I like there's, by the way, can we just mention something about Denethor there? Obviously, by the time we meet him, right? Gandalf with, uh, was it Mary? No, Pip, right? Comes yeah, yeah. through the thing with him. Mm hmm. And they get there. By the time we meet him, he's already broken. Like maybe he was already going a little bit crazy, but he just found out his beloved son was dead. And he's just sitting there on his throne with with Bohemir's broken horn, right? So he's gone. He's he's consumed by grief, all this kind of stuff. But I love the little arc they had with him there because, you know, he's like, yeah, go, go retake Os Gileath but it's overrun. Is there not a captain here who has the courage to do his Lord's will? So he knows he's sending him to his death, right? So he goes, and I love what Gandalf says to Eomir as he's leaving, not Eomir. Uh, Far Faramir. Faramir. Faramir, thank you. Uh, what he says to Faramir, your father loves you, Faramir, and he'll, re he'll realize it by the end. So Faramir gets brought back, his body all riddled with arrows, and at that moment, Denethor becomes completely broken. Like he just... He suddenly realizes what he had done and combined the little bit of going mad already, the death of Boromir, what he thought was the death of Faramir. And he goes and throws himself off. The damn guy, thing. Boromir, he sets himself a light on fire yes. and it runs off. It was it. annoying, man. But you know, it's, <laughs> but, I, I mean, mean you also felt for him a no, little bit, right? No, you didn't, He just man. He thought he just he walked out there. He sat there and didn't care about his other son, which is a travesty in itself. Sure. But he was I broken. Mean, he but, was he was hurt. But even that that you know the, the fact that they even delve into the fact that there's a favorite son that fathers have favorite sons. Oh, that, 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 the that other sons me. never received. I know that it, killed me. That I part mean, that there was a favorite. Yeah, uh, they hurts. didn't even have to touch on that in the film, but they did, and it's so resonant, and you feel it. You feel Faramir's like I, you know, I've, I've tried to be a good son. You know, you feel his pain. And Should you know, I return? I, think better of me, father. It depends oh. on the nature of your return. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, but I also love when Mary. Mary like sings the song oh, yeah, right. for Denethor, you know, and it's it's so it's just so great that that I, I mean there's so much going on in this movie and Peter Jackson and and Fan and Philippa deftly juggle all of these storylines and you never there's never a storyline in your where you where you go I'm bored of this one I want to get to the other storyline like all of this even though there's different threads it's all moving forward and it's it, 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 the narrative thrust of this story is so it's so great and i have to say you know i never you talked about the 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 fires have been lit yeah that scene you know when mary climbs up and finally lights the first the beacon first beacon and the camera just pans up and you're watching and the music the, the howard shore score rises and you see i mean it's just it's the, just flames being lit. The scope. I, I, I'm just like, uh, it's incredible. I mean, it, it's just this. And I, every, I was watching. I told you the other day, I was watching my 4K disc. I was adjusting my new screen, and I'm just, I'm watching this. I'm playing it. I'll, I just cranked it up. I was listening it so loud, and I watched it like three different times because I was adjusting the color, and it got me every every time. I felt the same. Yeah. It's just, and I've been watching this movie for 20 years. It's incredible. It's You're, incredible. Right, you were it's, it's funny how we can all find these moments, like even still today, that really will resonate with us emotionally. Ray, you were talking before the show started about the reforging of the Shards of Narsil, when they reforged the sword. I, I never understood the importance of that until I rewatched it, and for some reason, when he was given that sword, oh, when he pulls his cloak back and pulls, I had the sword up. Go, I had some goosebumps, oh, and I understood the power of that sword when I didn't understand what it meant at all before. You know, like I said, I'm a dumb kid, so <laughs> I, I don't understand the meaning of things until probably way later. So, and I understood it; it gave me goosebumps. I was like, "Let's go!" No wonder people, you know, the the dead. We're like, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> like you know, because I never understood that part. Like, I, I, I just didn't. I, I don't know, but um, like, I want to go back to the Faramir, Faramir, yeah. uh, part. Did nobody have any sense of like stealth or game planning? How do you run or charge just a camp like? Full forward. There's not a lot of other options, though. You I mean, can go around, maybe a couple guys. There's no going around. It was a big, flat 
empty field where oh, it's okay. guarded by the river. Like there's, it's like, so it was get a, it. It was a death wish then to do it, that. It was, and they all all knew. That's why, like, I, there's something so somber when Faramir gathers the guard and they're heading out. That like even the women and children lying in the street just hand them flowers. It's like so it's like Tia. it's pretty much all they all accepted. Yeah, they all knew they're like, not yeah, coming you're, back. You're done. And they came back. But only a part of them came yeah, back. Yeah, only part of them came which back. Which was crazy to me. I didn't notice that part until when I rewatched it. I didn't know it was her heads. I tell you, man, I need to pay attention to these movies when I first watch them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's just the event that gets to me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah it sure helps. I, I mean, and so, again, then we start going through. I love, once again, that one of the core central themes here is the we go back to the first film. It's the Fellowship of the Ring, and everything is still kind of held together by that fellowship. It's about these characters, one gone now because of Bohemir's dead, but that, what what did uh, Aragorn say in the first one? If we stay true to each other, right? And they're always wondering about Frodo and, and where he's at. But even then, as Aragorn is like trying to go off to find the ghost army himself, and, you know, Gimli's like, Face it, laddie, we're going with you. It's like yeah. this, it's, I, I, right? I love when he walks into that tunnel. He's like, I'm scared of no, I'm not scared of death or whatever. And he charges and his cape like flows behind him. Oh. I was like, let's go. <laughs> and like even uh, Le Legolas or Legolas, Legolas yeah. and uh, G Gimli, of course, they were both like, um, but Aragorn <laughs> was like, I'm not afraid of nothing. Like that part was so cool to me. I, I can't believe it. That and I also love how Gandalf kind of takes point in uh, Minas Tirith. Yeah, you know he's like leading the battle. That whole thing with the Witch King of you know Agmar and they're they're facing off against. Yeah. I mean the visuals. You you get all of it. You get you get the individual stories, but then you get those great epic fantasy tableaus where he's on shadow facts and he's like yeah and he's taking on the the most evil creature other than sauron himself it's awesome I, it's just awesome i love i love the end of the witch king though that part yeah. was good oh. too. that part was good too and it was a, a sad cool, part how it sucks inward you know oh. i love all that it's so cool they, they did so many things in this movie i still have yet to find anything comparable to it you know what I mean? There Some of the shots. Been. Twenty years. They're, 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 to this day, there nothing has come out that is comparable. And, 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 and why do you think that is? Do you think it's just the scope of a project like this? People are terrified to do it because I'm down for another three sets of like huge scope movies like this, or it's just like what they did was the impossible. Well, okay. There's a couple of things. Number one, it would be remarkably expensive to do something like this, right? It would just be incredibly expensive. Two, you, you're doing that kind of expense and you just know how people are going to respond. Like a lot of people thought back in the day when these films came out that this may open up a new golden era for sword and sandal movies, right? But it actually had the opposite effect. Suddenly everybody was afraid of being compared to Lord of the Ring. Yeah. Nothing you could possibly do was going to compare. There was a few things, like there was a... Um, what what's her name? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I can't remember the name of the actress off the top of my head. But there was like a Ar Arthurian movie that came out uh, that tried to kind of replicate it a little bit. There's a few things here and there. Some television shows have tried to replicate a Lord of the Rings, like we just said, the you know, Wheel of Time and things like that. But oh, yeah. you you have to do it on such a scope and have so many resources committed to it. And at the end of the day, you're just kind of terrified that people can say it's just a poor man's lord of the Rings. yeah i think the closest is game of thrones even though it wasn't yeah a movie. yeah it really i mean is. that was and i think the real you know I, it, it, you talk about something that could have been dune dune could have been if you really looked at the story of paul atreides the rise and fall of paul atreides and dune uh children of dune or dune 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 and dune messiah, messiah yeah so you could have done a, a, a they were going to make three movies dune uh prophet and then messiah was what they were going to do but a studio would never i think part of the reason this got made was you had one guy literally one guy bob shea bet his studio yeah bet new line yep on those crazy kiwis you know and peter jackson had been basically making these handcrafted movies whether it was bad taste or, or meet the feebles or brain dead and then he made the frighteners for universal so he had he had studio he had experience with the studio then he made heavenly creatures 
but this would not have gotten made any other way. It had to be Peter Jackson in their little country of, of New Zealand with all of these. I mean, literally the entire country got behind this movie. Yep. And and you had a guy like Rick Porras who was overseeing it for the studio for New Line. It was crazy what they did. I mean, with Weta, the, the 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 iteration of Weta and all that kind of stuff. Like there were so many stars that had to align for them to be able to do this movie. At a, it was a huge price tag, but incredibly small when you think about what they did. But if they weren't able to do it that cheaply, where they did it with who they did it with, it never would have happened. No, and they also had to come up with things like the massive software that they used yep. to create armies, the the grading, the digital color grading. They basically were making all that up as they went along. And my favorite thing was Gollum as a CG creature and that motion capture yeah. that they were, and they didn't even know how to do the skin. They had to write new algorithms to create subsurface scattering because skin is, is translucent and they couldn't, it can't be opaque because then it doesn't look real, you know? And they did so many things for the very first time on this and it all came together and there were these people that weren't going to give up. The fact was, if they wanted to go shoot a green screen shot, Peter Jackson could call and be like, hey, uh, we need to get a horse into the parking lot and a green screen, just throw up a green screen and we'll just put a Gandalf wig on somebody and, and have them rear up and shoot that. They could do that. No other people could do that. They could do that in New Zealand. And that's one of the things about this movie too, when you do like a, where you're supposed to be in another place. You're supposed to feel like this felt like you were there. Like sometimes you could that's tell, all oh, that's it, man. That, yeah. Oh, sometimes you could tell, like, and it takes you out of it. Oh, yeah, that's not that's not a real place. But a lot of the shots here, I'm like, where is this in this world? Yeah, I want to go here. I want to go to the in it. volcano. Now, somebody <laughs> in the live chat pointed out too. Like we were saying, it was very difficult for these movies to come out. So there were a couple shots taken at doing the next Lord of the Rings. One of them, of course, was Aragon, which. Was that with the E? With the E, right? Yeah, the one about the with dragon, the dragon babies and, and the stuff. Kid, yeah. The kid, the kid, that young movie kid wasn't was, bad at all. It's, that? He was like, he was a young kid when he started writing those books. He was like in his late teens, early twenties. Yeah, the books were very successful. The thing, and the movie was terrible. Oh, you like? You didn't like? Oh, it? I thought it was okay. Awful. Oh, I thought it was so bad, and that that kind of set the whole genre back as well. Uh, but it, it has been many. Now look, let's address this quickly, and then we'll go over and take everybody else's right. thoughts on this. When one of the things, including if you go to like one of my most beloved movies ever, which is Clerks 2, everybody <laughs> loves to joke about the multiple endings of Lord of the Rings. And I'll tell you why they're awesome and why they did them and why they got away what, from what? them and nobody else can do them. Yeah. There's multiple endings to Lord of the Rings? Like, oh, yeah. To Return of the King? Oh, yeah. Well, by, by multiple endings, it's movie. like in the movie, it feels like, okay, oh, that's the ending. Oh, going, oh right. Okay, okay. Ending. Oh, there's another ending. You're right. So here's the thing. I think by the time they were into Return of the King, they all knew we have made one of the most epic film series in the history of cinema, right? And we as the audience had come along on a three-year journey that we were all invested in, we all loved dearly. And these are iconic, larger-than-life, mythological characters to us that are real to us, as, as Ray was pointing out. They're real to us. These places were real to us. And so by the time we get to the end of our three-year journey, there were several things to wrap up properly, including the coronation of the King of Men, which, of course, which is one of the greatest moments in cinematic history when the king of men and all of Middle Earth take a knee in front of four hobbits. It's my friends, you bow to no one. I, I still get chills and almost cry every time that thing happens. You need to have the going into the West part where they get on the boats with the elves and Bilbo is there. An old man Bilbo is now there and there's nothing left there for Frodo and they have to sail to the East. You have to follow with Samwise back to the Shire and what mm. his life is like. This, it wasn't just the end of a movie. It was the end of a three year journey that got us to that point. And I thought the multiple endings were not just called for, they were fantastic. And by the time the credits rolled, right? I've never been as emotionally moved in credits in my life because the credits roll in this movie and they do those, that brown parchment paper, with the, the sketches of the characters retaking us through the journey we've been on as frickin' Annie Lennox's Into the West plays, which also won the Academy Award. 
that can you see on the horizon? That's playing as we're seeing through these illustrations, re-going through the journey with them. I, I was just an emotional mess sitting there in that. So I don't know, Rob, the, the, the multiple endings. Thing. Uh, well, I, I have to say, I completely agree with you. And when I saw the film originally, there were two more endings. You saw Legolas and you saw Gimli, you know, in their realms. Yep. But I have to say something about adaptation. There's a lot of Tolkien purists who you talk about the ending. The ending of Lord of the Rings, as people know, there's something called the scouring of the Shire. In the book, they get back to the Shire after all of this. And Saruman and Wormtongue have taken over the Shire and eviscerated it. It's a mess. And, and our, our, our Mary Pippin and, and uh, Sam and, and Frodo come back. And a lot of Tolkien peers go, well, they should have had the scouring of the... John, can you imagine at the end of this three-film saga, if they finally got back to the saga, uh, they finally got back to the Shire, and they did the Tolkien ending, where you know he's making a comment on the industrialization of it all, never would have worked. This is why adaptation is important. Yeah. And you need people who understand... You cannot translate things 100% because when you go into the medium of movies, you have to have an ending where we are left elated after what we saw could have been the end of the world. Yep. And those multiple endings, like you said, it's an emotional crescendo that built, it's almost like a symphony. You know what it is? It's like Beethoven's Ninth, the Ode to Joy. You know, one of my favorite pieces of classical music where it's bombastic and loud and it's incredible and you feel lifted up like angels are singing to you. All of those endings add to that emotional power and you couldn't not have them. You know, you couldn't not have them and that's why the movie ends, I mean, on such a powerful, powerful note. And this is, I think, what great fantasy filmmaking could do and it's really hard. That's why we don't get it all the time. I just had one thing left to say. There was only one part that bothered me in this movie, and I don't know why it did, but when the eagles come down and grab Frodo or whatever, none of them got burnt, not even a little bit. If anyone's ever been around lava. It was quick. They had to get in there quick and leave quick. I'm just kidding. No, no, that part was cool too. That part was great. I loved it. I loved the eagles. Those things were cool. Ripping off the thing. Uh, Whatever the other flying things were called, ripping off their heads when they came into oh, battle. Oh yeah! Oh, that and, was so great. The aerial battle part of it. It was great. But by the way, can I just say something? You know, somebody asked, and people have always said this about this. Well, why didn't they just have the eagles fly them into Mordor in the first place? It's a fair question. It's a fair. <laughs> but even Tolkien snapped back. He clapped back at somebody. There's a great clip you can see it when somebody asked him this. But here's the thing: they couldn't penetrate the power of Mordor. Those eagles could not have flown into Mordor when Sauron was just hold up and yeah, couldn't do it. They could not, they were not powerful enough to get in there. And it wasn't until he was toppled until Sauron's power was broken and the ring was destroyed that they were even allowed to even get near Mordor. That's at least in my head canon. Did, That's you, what it is. did you guys notice one part where they, the actual heroes looked distressed when the, wasn't it when the gates first opened and uh, Legolas and all them saw all the that whole well, war course, coming that, up. Yeah, there, there's that a good probably, shot of that. Yeah, right yeah. That's probably like the part where I was like, oh, crap, what's going to happen here? We're going to we don't even have that much men left. But they're, I they're love being this surrounded, scene too. right? This scene, too, because, you know, uh, Aragorn just looked back at them, right? Like as these armies come in, he looks back at his friends and he does, Leroy James! <laughs> and he just goes like running straight in. <laughs> like, that's exactly what he did. But he was such a G throughout the whole thing. Oh, man. he was. He was so gangster throughout the whole he thing. It's crazy. He was the best. He was the best. All right. Guys, we've, we've spoken enough on it. Let's now hear from the rest of the members of Movie Club here. You guys, to see what you guys have had to say about this. That was our extended edition? Yeah. I need to watch that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's in the special I wonder if anyone ever made that video. I'm, now I want to see that. Leroy! <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to see that so bad. Anyway, okay, let's get into it here. Rob, what do we got in here? What have our members of Movie Club been asking in here? Uh, Phoenix King Theo says, my all-time favorite movie. Everything is amazing, from the acting to the score. I can't even decide on the best part, but the ride of Rohan for, Fr oh. for Frodo, you have to bow to no one. They're up there. I always tear up when Frodo leaves. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, by the way, Phoenix King sent in $20 on that. Thank you so much for that, for supporting us on that level. 
it, again, Dude. it's 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 a movie that is filled with the most iconic scenes, the biggest battles, the most compelling narratives, and the best one-liners. <laughs> and the best one-liners. Like you just mentioned a whole bunch of oh god, there's that scene. I cannot help. I I weep in this scene as the all of Middle Earth kneels to for just went the way Aragorn says it, my friends. You bow to no one. And Middle Earth bows in these... Uh, I'm getting choked up thinking about because it. Because they That's were so sent good. on a death trip. Yeah. They weren't supposed to make it. They had no one to make it. Yeah. They did. Yeah, they did. And They've that's... been through everything. Of course they're not going to bow to anybody. Because no. as Aragorn said, they held true to each other. And that's what got them through it. All right, what do we got next? Uh, we have uh, Extant Crab says, The Charge of the Rohirrim is the greatest scene in cinema history. It's so good. Everything is perfect, from fed and speech to the music to the panic in the faces of the orcs. Oh, dude, I'm so glad Dad. you brought that up. Dad. But he's so right. Like, that that moment when... And it was it felt really good as an audience member because that moment when the, the ride of the Rohirrim starts and then he does do a quick cut of some of the orcs' faces, like, guess what? Orcs are people, too. And they looked up and they shit themselves. Because yeah. yeah. you see the throng of Rohirrim coming over that hill, downhill, on horseback at you, and you're sitting there with your little pointy stick. And they shit themselves. And I, I just, I love that little decision by Peter Jackson to yep. show them crap. Them, crap them you know, and I also do like the fact that he also shows, to speak to that, that the, the forces that have come to Mordor's aid, they think that they're on the winning side. Yeah, Sauron's going to win this one. Whether they're on the Oliphants or whatever, they all think they're all kind of smug about yep. it. Like yep. all the tribes that have that have taken, that made the journey yep. to here. And I love when they get their asses handed to them. Because yep. it's just great. It's beautiful. It. All right, what's next? Uh, Ethan Holgate says, during the pandemic, I saw all three extended versions of Lord of the Rings in theaters. It took the length of the pandemic to watch that. <laughs> on re-release, truly three epic experiences I'll never forget during that time also. Well, I love, Ethan, that that I love that during the pandemic, you can say that that was a good experience that you had. Well, see, here's one of the things. You guys will remember that during the pandemic, a lot of we heard from a lot of people that would write in and say, I just watched The Godfather for the first time. Yep. And I just watched Lord of the Rings for the first time. Like, I mean, there wasn't a lot else to do. Get caught up in some of the great classic movies. But ah, so many people finally got around to watching Lord of the Rings. And they were like, what have I been doing with my life? Right. Up till now. Which, yep. So that that is a great thing, man. Thanks for no, sharing that. Fantastic. Uh, David... S David Sock and Lotion <laughs> sent in a super chat and says, <laughs> finally, my favorite of the trilogy. When I was a kid, I had an Aragorn action figure from this movie, and I loved it. I don't know what happened to it, but it's okay. I got a sock now. <laughs> Have a great day. Listen, I as I look back. Just one? On all of my Transformers and Star Wars toys, I can't tell you for any of them, what happened to any of them. I just know I don't have them anymore. <laughs> I, I wish I, I did. I actually have these Lord of the Rings figures. I collected one for each character, but the only one I regret not buying is Gimli. I don't know why. Oh, because yeah. I felt that he's, his figure was so small. I was like, and they were all the same price. I was like, I'm not going to buy that little thing for <laughs> that. For the same price they were like the $20. They're $20. I have Legolas, Aragorn, before he was crowned from the first movie, and uh, Frodo. That came with the little ring. They're in the garage. Still nice. got them. That's good. Yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, Jared Vester says, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. With the music swelling in the background, oh. it was peak cinema for me. Jared, I mean, it all leads up to that. That moment, that moment is so great because literally... I mean, they're literally on. They're on the slope of Mount Doom. This is it, man. This is the. This is they're, they're going to the finish line here. They're either going to make it or not. They're not, and it all comes down. What does it come down to? Friendship. It, it comes down to being able to trust someone. Literally, not just with your life, but with the lives of all mankind. Their bond. These two, two hobbits from the Shire. The entire planet Earth, though the fate of Middle Earth comes down to these two dudes. And what I love, what whatever Frodo was losing or, or like began uh, missing from himself that the ring was taken, 
Samwise was filling in those gaps. Yep. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? And that, 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 yeah, that was beautiful to me. That, and, and it all, both Sam's voice and the music started this crescendo, right? I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you as the music hyped up with it too. And it's like, damn man so i would have left a long time ago <laughs> yoink like, see you later oh, we going up that at, at this temperature <laughs> man you know i love you bro <laughs> good luck I'm all right out. what's next uh tyler shoon says the ride of the rohirrim or portals avengers assemble look all due respect to how great the portal scene is in Endgame, and it is great. The writer there here, it's, you can't touch this. You can't, you can't touch it. You can't, just can't. Also, I mean, the design work. You, you, you know, I would say there's a there's a difference in that a lot of the Marvel stuff is designed in a way by a committee. You know, the Marvel design group, whereas the the. The ride of the Rohirrim and the whole battle of the Pel Pelennor Fields. While a lot of people worked on it, there was there was one effects artist. His job for a year was to figure out just how the toppling of Sauron's tower was going to work. He worked on that single effect shot. But there, with Peter Jackson's oversight, there was much more of a handcrafted feel to it. Whereas I loved I loved Endgame and Infinity War, but the fact is that is a corporate product as much as i love the marvel cinematic universe whereas the lord of the rings represents a country coming together but handcrafting by artisans you know it's less computer and more people literally putting their hands on it, even though they use computers i mean i feel that the end of the end of this movie is much more it's got a, a much more human quality to it I, I just want to add one little thing about it. It's just the feeling between both things. Yeah. Like at least in Lord, Lord of the Rings, I still felt danger. I felt like we might, you know, like I felt the sense of danger. And in Endgame, I never felt that, that they were going to lose. Like there was like, <laughs> like there was like, any danger, like at all. Like in this one, I felt like, oh, we got, but we could still lose. I mean, this is like, you know, like the feelings you get from watching these wars in Lord of the Rings aren't the same feelings I get when I watch but, the end There's also, I, I say this sometimes point. that action without narrative purpose is just visual noise, right? And obviously there's narrative going on in portals and Endgame. Absolutely there is. But in Return of the King with the Rite of Rohirrim, we had been following now all movie, this, the Rohirrim and their trek to get there, the gathering of the various forces just to arrive there on time. And then, so we've been, we for hours have been following them to get there. In Endgame, which is fantastic, that end scene, but yeah. in Endgame, it's just ch -ch -ch on your left. <laughs> oh, and they're there. And, and right? only, so, uh, everybody's there. Like, yeah, you haven't seen, like, they're all there, which is great. It's cool, but I don't think it has the... It, it, it's it's a moment of, of cool for the time being, whereas the moment in Lord of the Rings has been, like you said, it's been... It's like a symphony. The You've payoff. been listening to it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a payoff. That's exactly it. All right, what's next? Josh Becker says, I rewatch the extended trilogy every year, and what an experience it is. My favorite scene is when Aragorn tells the hobbits, you bow to no one. It's uh, Again, it's, it's the scene in movies that chokes me up every single time. Again, because it was a three-year journey to that moment yeah. of him. It just wasn't a good one-liner. It was a journey we've been on with all of these characters that went from Aragorn being a guy saying, I got to look out for four halflings in a bar <laughs> to the point where now as the king of men he kneels to them and says you bow to no one it's just it's just an incredible summation of the narrative all right what's yeah. next uh the next one is the official newbies sends in a 20 dollars super chat well thank you thank man you, official newbies i was in chicago when you guys did the first two i was sad thinking i was going to miss out on my favorite <laughs> trilogy watching it live in the words of the immortal rob Dude. Dude, I love this franchise. My love for films came from Lord of the Rings. I mean, Look, I think there's probably an entire generation of film fans today that, like, if, like for me, it was the, the original Star Wars trilogy. That's what created my love affair with movies for mm -hmm. my whole life. 
fast forward a few years after me, I, I think the Lord of the Rings are that. I mean, everybody's going to have their various favorite movies, yeah. but I think there's a lot of film fans today that will point to the Lord of the Rings and saying, yeah, th those aren't necessarily my all-time favorite movies, but those are the movies that made me fall in love with movies. Can you imagine if you were like eight years old and saw Fellowship for the first time? <sighs> And then every year you got to see this, like your folks would take you how formative it would have been. Oh. We had to wait three years between Star Wars movies. But here's the bad thing about it. We ain't ever seen anything that equaled it. Nope. Like, it's like, it's like yeah, that's as good as it gets. It's all downhill from here. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah. what's next? Um, Wayne Joy says, uh, one, I've seen the extended version more times in theaters than I have the theatricals. <laughs> I saw each in theaters one or two times during their initial run. Two, a month before the first Hobbit, they ran the extended as a trilogy. Wow. And a few years ago, Regal put them in RPX theaters for a week. Yeah, I think that's one of the... Before I saw Return of the King, at the Cinerama in Hollywood, they showed the extended versions of... It was a day-long thing. I still have my pass on the lanyard. Your 12-hour yeah. day. Yeah, it was my 12-hour day. noon to midnight. But you know what? The anticipation of that, because no one had seen... And I didn't work on the Return of the King behind the scenes because I was working on Narnia. So, so I do nothing about Return of the King and sitting in that theater with the diehards, dude, that was, I mean, the feeling in that theater by the end, I mean, the more sniffling, more crying, yeah. it, was, it was incredible. It was incredible. All right. What's next? Um, the official newbies is back, uh, with a $20. Thank you chat official again. newbies. Um, I gush. Every time I hear someone talking about Lord of the Rings, me and my friends quote the charge all the time. What an effing great moment. Grr moment. A grr moment. moment. Grr. Yeah. I watch these three movies every year on my birthday. What a historic cinematic achievement. Listen, my all-time favorite movies are Star Wars. They are, and I'll wrote, watch them probably several times a year. But there's only one set of movies that I, in my head I know every year I have to watch these movies, and that's Lord of the Rings. It, it, it's the, like every once in a while, with all the movies we watch, every once in a while you want to go back to what's the template of the perfect movies. You got to watch The Godfather. You got to watch Lord of the Rings. You got to get these things. It's it's right up there. And and you're right, the Gurr moments, the emotional moments, all these things. I think there's a lot of, like, again, not everybody says Lord of the Rings is their favorite movie, but almost all serious film fans I know will say, Watching Lord of the Rings is an annual event for them. You yeah. must do this, right? And you can see why. You totally can. All right. It's fulfilling. It totally On is. an emotional yeah. level. Uh, James Howie says, The Siege of Minas Tirith and the Battle of the Pelennor Fields is still the most epic thing I've seen put to film almost 20 years later. I can't disagree. I, I have yet to see. Like Again, you go to uh, the Portals battle in Endgame. Maybe the closest thing to come to it. Yeah. Yeah. But still, nothing has touched it. Like, still, almost two decades later, we still are waiting for something that can come close to, to what they pulled off, what Peter Jackson did there. The Hobbit films didn't do it. Uh, nothing in DC or Marvel has done it. I, I mean, it's just, I don't know if it'll ever be touched, to be honest with you. Yeah. All right, what's next? Ryan Loner says, and now Denethor's, Denethor is Aomir's father in The Boys. Yes. And still terrible. And still terribly. <laughs> so awful. I still, I geeked out when I was watching the boys. I was like, it's a Lord of the Rings reunion. Yeah. And, the and, and you know they did that on purpose. Oh, yeah. And of course, these two guys never had a scene together right. in the movie. <laughs> but like, all I could think about was Lord of the Rings when they were doing that scene together. So all right, great. What's next? Uh, Will Van Wagner says, hey, John, Rob, and Ray, longtime viewer, but this is my first time writing in. Oh, thank you for writing in, Will. This is my favorite movie of all time, and there are so many incredible, one of two, uh, there we go, moments. But one of my favorites is when Aragorn is at the Black Gate and being tempted by Sauron. He then turns to the camera and says, for Leroy J. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. For, for Frodo. Yeah. And, and again, showing what going back to what he said earlier in the series when he says, if we stay true to each other. And in that moment, he's reminding the, the audience that even now we are thinking of Frodo. We are doing this to keep Sauron's eye on us. So whatever Frodo's doing, he can do it yeah. you know, better. I, I mean, it's just, a, it's so perfect the way they did that. You know, one of the things I do like in the extended version of this is the mouth of Sauron that comes out oh, yeah. and it's it's just i love the design the way of the he mouth. talks yeah and... <laughs> it's, it's, i mean i know why they had to cut it out of the theatrical but i do love that you know he's great all right what's next 
Um, oh, there, <laughs> there, there it is. is. I mean, the way you the way he would talk, in. and then the way he would smile. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, this dude's so and creepy. Spe- it's so great and so uh, disgusting. That's only in the extended, right there. Yeah, yeah. it's only in the. Extended. I, that's why it did, didn't look familiar. To yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Totally Aiden Foley says the extended's an hour longer. It's like four hours long. Right? Yeah, Aiden four Foley hours. says, "My friends, you, you bow, bow to no one, one. again." Excellent one of the- line, Aiden. So yes, we've. How, how, it's one of our favorites. Yep, one of the best. You know, it never and it never gets old. Mista forty seven with a nineteen ninety nine super chat. Thank you, Mista. Mista. There were two moments when some. <laughs> <laughs> there were two moments when some thug tears fell. <laughs> when Frodo wakes up and sees Gandalf again. Yeah. And oh, I love dude, I love that. I love that. And when Samwise walks in last, the music kicks in. They smile and the music swells. The journey is finally over. Beautiful scene. Dude, as I'm reading that, what are you saying? I'm feeling it right here. I feel like when they come in, you know, when he wakes up after the whole exp- it gets me every time too. I feel it now. I hear. I can hear the music, in the slow motion shot when they come onto his bed. Come on. You know what? It's. I. I don't want to wax poetic here, but it reminds you of what. I, I love the fact that the title of the movie, the first one, is Fellowship. Mm-hmm. You know, there's you got friends, but do you have a fellowship? <laughs> do you have a group of people around you that are so loyal? And so faithful to each other and so there for each other that you would literally go into the gates of Mordor, right? And at that moment, when he wakes up and then he sees Sam. I mean, that's just such a beautiful, emotional, tender, just fantastic, fantastic moment. That's a great question, John. Do you have, you might have friends, but do you have a fellowship? Do you have a fellowship? Now, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Uh, Will Van Wagner says, moments. But one of my favorites is when Aragorn is at the Black Gate. And being tempted, by, oh, we already oh, yeah, read yeah, that. Yeah, that. I guess that was doubled up. Yeah, so it was doubled. No, up. no, that was part oh, two. It was part two. Sorry about that. Well, you know, we did it again. It was fine. Uh, never lose your nerd. Sends in a super chat and says, "You bow to no one makes me tear up every, every time, time." Never lose your nerd every sure. single time. Uh, Ryan Loner says, "Theoden touching everyone's spears before the oh. charge was Bernard Hill's own idea and very hard to do as he's left-handed. They cast the right guy." You oh. Know. I, I'm I'm to get it the right guy. Oh, I you got it. <laughs> I just, like the casting of Theoden. I mean, look, all actors. Somebody else could have played the role. Yeah, now for wrath. Now, now for, for ruin. ruin. Oh. Dawn. I mean, that's another movie, but okay. But I mean, there there is a there is a frailty and a power that Bernard Hill brought to that. Right, you needed both of those in Theoden. And when you get to the to the final battle here, it's all the power. Oh yeah, and you know what's interesting from. From two towers, when he asks the question, "How did it come to this?" Yeah, it's almost like he's resolved to the fact that we're going to lose. And he, after the two towers experience, the guy's been completely re-energized. And in Return of the King, he is an unstoppable—I mean, not quite unstoppable, but an unstoppable force. And I like that. I mean, you see him get his second win through that performance, and he's as powerful as he ever will be in Return of the King, and it's fantastic. His belief was super strong in uh, Return of the King. Well, and it was Even, restored by Aragorn, yeah, right? Yeah. Because he he was a, a little bit lost, but it was like, but like right from what he says to his niece, he's an honorable man. Like, he understands that he draws strength from him as well. I think he drew a lot of inspiration from him, and then he really comes, it's, it's not till we get to Return of the King that he comes into his full self. I think that moment when Aragorn comes in and says... You know, the beacons have been lit, Gunner calls for age. That's the moment he really comes back into himself when he says, yeah. and Rohan will answer. And and that from there on out, he's and the king. I, you know, that's another thing about these movies that don't get enough credit. There is changes to these characters. Oh, yeah. They had a, yeah, yeah. you know, open wars upon you, whether you wish it or not. He didn't want any part of it. But by the time you get to Return of the King, he's like, we'll do whatever it takes. And by the way, somebody in the live chat reminds us, Stephen Stranger Things writes in the live chat. So he's, Bernard Hill, like, first of all, one of the biggest, greatest, most Academy Award winning film of all time, but also in, for a long time, the biggest box office film of all time. He was the captain of the Titanic. That is correct. And James Cameron's Titanic. <laughs> yes, yes. So he's a captain of a lot of ships. All right, what's next? <laughs> uh, Mighty Tank One says, Samwise is the true hero of the story. Such a bro. Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to say he's the true hero of the story, but he is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the story. Yes. Like, that moment, like... How many times does the story stop moving forward if Samwise isn't there, yep. right? I mean, he's just the most faithful, loyal. He he doesn't have 
Like he's not as mighty as Gimli. He doesn't have the power of Gandalf. He's just a hobbit, but he doesn't matter. He'll walk into Mordor with Frodo. It's so good. All right, what's next? It's true. Uh, Orange Hand says, from the extended edition, when you hang from a giblet for the sport of your own crows, we shall have peace. Giblets and crows, dotard. I like that. What part was that from again? Uh, I do not remember. Because I, 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 I very rarely watch the extended editions. I've, I only watch about once every five years. I want to say, does Den Denethor say that? I don't remember. Maybe it's, maybe it's, I don't remember. All right. What's next? <laughs> it's, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Mickey Beach. Row. Oh, it's it's that, the Theoden talking to Saruman. Uh, oh, okay. For, oh, 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 okay. That makes sense. Um, oh, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about yes, that scene at the beginning. <laughs> I was like, Mickey is there Beach, an eagle? <laughs> Mickey Beach says, I had to figure that out. The Return of the King actually refers to the Return of Movie Club. Uh, in today's context. Cheers, everybody. That's right. Yes, it does. What All a great right. movie to return to. It comes to. in pints. <laughs> it comes in pints. Um, I'm uh, getting one. Chris Barcina sends in a super chat and says, The Ride of the Rohan at Minas Tirith is arguably the best moment of the entire trilogy. Well, it's certainly one of them. I mean, and, and you know what? By design. Yeah, you know, you, it's you, a you, crescendo. You, it's, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, that's what's go, so great about this, these movies. It's like a three-act symphony, you know, and it's, it really is done well. And... They really did such a beautiful job constructing it because they had you had to make sure Return of the King outdid the ba the Battle of Helm's, Helm's Deep. Deep yep. You know, you had which to do seemed that. impossible, <laughs> right? Absolutely impossible, yeah. and they did it. When they blow up, when they use the gunpowder and they blow up the 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 deeping wall, the outer wall. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like how can anything get more epic than that? <laughs> well, the battle. They of the did Mother about Fields. eight things more epic than it, it in that one my battle. Beer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Guillaume LaBelle says, Oh, I think oh, wait, Death, pardon Punch. Me. Death Punch 70 says off topic. You made Lost River Driven Channel about wait, what? Hang on a second. Hang on. Oh, this John, you're gonna love this. Death Punch 70 says, off topic, you made the Lost River Driven Channel about to faint when you tipped them today. Oh. <laughs> they are huge fans and they were in total shock. Thank you for making that. Oh, okay. Day. I know what this is referring to. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, so, oh, yeah. Not, okay, so uh, I, I listen, it's, it's no joke. I am a big movie talk fan. I love hearing movie talk. I love hearing sports talk, so I'll go to my ESPN or whatever. I will sometimes just hop on YouTube, and I'll search for what live streams are going on right now about movies. I even asked in my community tab about it last night. I said, what are some good live streams? I just like watching people talking about movies. So as we were getting ready to do movie club today, I mm -hmm. had a little bit of time, hopped on YouTube. I just like, hey, uh, what 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 live movie chat sort of thing is happening right now? And I came across these guys who I had not had heard of them before. And I'm like, oh, and they were talking about some horror movies. And I was liking the discussion and I, I sent in a tip. And I didn't mean for it to hijack the discussion because they stopped talking about the horror movies. I was really tip, getting, though. I was really getting into their discussion, and they st <laughs> and then they started. To, but anyway, no, it was. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate you you mentioning that. But Pretty it was, cool. Yeah, it was a really good. It was a good stream going on. I was enjoying it. All right, what's next? Um, Guillaume Labelle says seeing this movie in theaters before the pandemic was truly magical. Mm. It felt like watching it for the first time, a second time, near epic perfection half the time it works every time no i mean and listen i it's been it's been a beat since i've seen it in theaters yeah i, I mean look e, every movie theater should be required to have their operating yep. license to play these yep. movies once a year yep until something beats it it should be required to be <laughs> should, like, hey, like you gotta play at least once a year. you gotta pick one day a year that you play the lord of the rings films 100%. and everybody who wants to be a card-carrying movie fan needs to go watch this yeah. true yeah. all right what's next true uh, Mickey Veach says, we come to it at last. <laughs> the greatest movie of all time. Gandalf, probably. Yeah, the battle of our time. Uh, for, uh, I mean, it's again, this movie is filled with so many moments. Yeah, it's so good. Like, so many moments. E like, even that moment where Gandalf, there's a wonderful moment where throughout the trilogy, Gandalf has been given poor uh, Peregrine Took a really hard time, <laughs> yeah. right? 
fool of a took. Throw yourself down next time so we can be rid of your stupidity or whatever, right? Yes. But they're, they're sit down before the big battle and lead, like basically he's happening. What happens when I die here? And Gandalf tells him of the feet. Like, it's just, it's. Oh, a, yeah, that part was beautiful. Too. So yeah. many great moments in this movie. And we didn't so even cool. mention the undead part, which was a cool part, too. We didn't even go over. There's so many things that happen here. Yeah. Oh, so good. All right. What's next? And they have, they agree to follow Aragorn. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey. Bruce Crawford says Peter Jackson was still making Return of the King after it won Best Picture at the Oscars. He was still shooting the extended edition scenes. That is true, by the way. Crazy. Is, really? They were still. Yeah, they were still fr- filming. Yeah, oh, that. yeah. I was trying to hand him the Academy Award. And he's like, <laughs> give me a minute. I'm still cutting. <laughs> yeah, they were shooting like the scenes when the in the extended version where all the skulls in the Army of the Dead scene when they go get the Army of the Dead. I think that was like the last thing they shot was. By the way, let me. I should point this one thing out. One of the things I really do not like about Peter Jackson as a filmmaker, and this is a small nitpick, small nitpick, is Peter Jackson is obsessed with, in every one of his movies, at least since Lord of the Rings films, he has to have at least two scenes where he has a shot in slow motion at 10 frames per second. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Where it'd be like, like this, this slow motion thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, and he does it repeatedly in this movie. He Then he started doing it in King Kong as well. <laughs> I really don't like those shots. I don't like the sudden slow motion at like 15 frames per second thing. It's just, I know what he's going for. It just, those shots never work for me. No, whatever. Yeah. Is it, it's again, small nitpick. Who cares? All right, what's next? Uh, Bam Ham Yum says, <laughs> Sam carrying Frodo up the mountain. It makes me tear up every time. Yep. It's such a beautiful moment, and Sam is the best friend in all of cinema. I'll tell you why he's the best He's the best friend. Because Frodo effed him over several times. Yes. Like, that's... To me, there's no bigger loyalty than when loyalty is not returned. And, and, and he understood. He's being under the, the thing of the ring and everything. But he got... He let Smeagol turn him against Sam and Sam never wavered. And that is, that's what the most incredible thing about Samwise Gamgee in this is like, yeah. it's, it's, it's not as hard to be totally loyal to a friend who's totally loyal to you. It's when the chips are really down and they've rejected you and whatever, and they need you most and you are still there. That's, that's a rare thing, man. Totally agree. Rare thing. All right. What's totally next? Totally agree. Uh, Curtis Lopez says Campia. Movie club is back. The <laughs> notifications have been sent. Us and the sons of Campia shall answer. The sons of filthy man. This, yeah, that it's it's it is back. It is good to be back. We love doing movie club, and we are sorry that we've had to miss a little while. But what a great one to come back to with Return yeah, of the King. Perfect. Absolutely. All right. What's next? Uh, Guillaume Labelle comes back and says, "I don't get emotional very often, but Frodo saying goodbye to his Hobbit friends at the end makes me cry like a baby." So powerful. You know, I think to this day, I don't know about you guys, I still don't, and I think this is a good thing, I still don't really get his decision. And and I think that's a good thing because I don't, because I think we are supposed to be like all of his friends. I don't think any of his friends really got it. He Why he decided I have to leave. And I think Peter Jackson does something kind of interesting there where oftentimes when characters don't understand something, we as the audience get it because we've seen extra stuff. But we don't go right into the head of Frodo. And how how broken he like listen you don't get to carry the ring of power that long and not have it break you right it, it there was something that was irreparably broken in frodo as a result of his experiences and we didn't see it on the surface and sam didn't see it on the surface i, I think gandalf understood it yep but at that end when he made the decision that he had to leave it i loved the fact that we felt the loss like Samwise was feeling the loss. And I did, and it's to this day, I still don't fully, fully get it. Um, and yeah, on weather, yeah, like weather everything top. from, from the weather top to how much the carrying the ring battered his entire soul and spirit mm-hmm. and like mentally and everything too. There's something really beautiful about not knowing. Mm-hmm. And we just know that he knew he had to go. I, I just love that. I Agreed. thought that was great. All right. What's next? Alex von Gollum. 
says the cinematography and sound design of the sequence when the witch king of agmar leaves his castle is beautiful mm. i'm telling you what all throughout the film that screech oh yeah of the witch king we we heard it in the first film we heard it in this one i, I just it's just incredible it's again uh, you know as much as star wars the sound design that's a screech i've only ever heard in lord of the rings yeah you know and, and like the tie fighters there's no other place where you can hear that nope. sound and right. uh <laughs> yeah that's great. the scene right there yeah he's saying, <laughs> Whatever that thing is, yeah. What that, is, that's not a very put good that on person. loop on a CD. A <laughs> Orange Hand says Gandalf brought a third eagle to carry Gollum. Did he? Was I, there was there a, an empty eagle there as they were flying away? Maybe he did bring one for I Gollum. Mean, what a nice guy. Mm. Yeah, I would have well, left him. All right, what's next? Uh, Mickey Veach says the shot of all the orcs running away from the Black Gate after Sauron's death might be one of the special effects that hasn't aged well, well, listen. I will. I will say this. As you remember, this movie is now getting close to decades old, right? There are some moments. I think I said this during the Fellowship of the Rings thing. The only effects that start to look questionable are all matters of compositing. Yeah. Right. Whether it's when the uh, the dragon creatures are attacking mm -hmm. Minas Tirith and they're like picking up some of the guys and dropping them. Yeah, but it's all just the compositing. Compositing was only at a certain level at that time. Yeah. The way that movie holds up today, visual effects wise, being a movie that's nearly two decades old is stupid. And and then also, it, oh, it's always followed up by something that looks incredible. Yeah. So you just forget about it. I and, mean, yeah, pretty quickly. It. And also, I think there's a little bit of forgiveness in that it, it is Middle Earth. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's not so. So you kind of you kind of gloss over things that that uh, the amount of effects work that's jumping in and out of your eye line. I mean, it's 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 still astonishing what they were able to do. All right, what's next? Uh, Ty Burton says my absolute favorite movie of all time. It moves me to tears every time, and hearing Annie Lennox sing "Into the West" is a spiritual experience. The thing about Annie Lennox is "Into the West," which also won the Academy Award that year, and one of my favorite oscar performances of all time of all time but it's a song that was not just perfect for the end of a movie it was a song that was perfect for the end of a three-year journey mm -hmm. as the boats are literally sailing into the west and she sings into the west um it is tonally melodically lyrically it was the perfect song to end the Lord of the Rings trilogy. As again, those 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 images played as the credits rolled of the sketches of taking us through the journey. I'm I am fucking getting emotional right now. Think about it. Listen, I'm gonna tell you right now, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to my office, I'm gonna crank up Annie Lennox's into the West, and I'm gonna to listen to it again. It is just the perfect ending for the series. Plus, you know, that song, the movie wasn't finished too too long or too right before. There was only a little bit of time before it actually opened in theaters. So maybe Annie Lennox was actually just singing to Peter Jackson, lay down your weary head, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, All right, it's what's okay. next? Uh, Ty Burton goes on to say, also, I don't remember it being talked about too much in the Two Towers movie club, but can we talk for a minute about how incredible Andy Serkis is as Gollum? Well, it was the, there was some murmuring at the mm -hmm. time about a Best Supporting Actor Oscar nomination. That was small murmuring. It's when, and building upon that, that Andy Serkis then did Caesar, that there was like serious chatter about can a motion capture performance be given a Best Supporting Actor nomination? And it was all built on what he did with Gollum, and now he came in and did Caesar, and, and, and I still, to this day, kind of think he should have been given a Best Supporting Actor yeah. nomination. For I mean, Caesar, if for but... nothing else, the scene where he's talking to himself, when Gollum and Smeagol are having their conversation. Oh my God, that scene is so good. It's one of the greatest scenes in oh. cinema history. All right, what's next? Uh, Blackjack Hooligan sends in a super chat and says, it's nitpicky, but wish Endgame gave us as much time to the characters during the battle like it did with this. And both are uh, somehow the same length. Yeah, but the sheer number of characters. Right. Right? The sheer volume of key characters. Like, you, you, there was only so much screen time to be given. And, yeah. I'll, and I'll be honest with you. As fantastic as the Portals battle is... There were an awful lot of choreographed moments to, to kind of give characters their moments. Like for what is it called uh, when all the female characters gather the something force A force? Yeah, yeah, A force. Yeah, like the, the A, A force, force shot. I love the shot. 
but very contrived. Yeah. There were several shots actually that were like, okay, we got to give these characters their moments now. Now we got to give these characters. And when they're tossing now. off the gauntlet, you know, everyone. Yeah, gets like their that. I get, but moment. again, it was great. It was great. It was great. But I don't know that there was. I already felt like they were kind of stretching it mm -hmm. as it was. Yeah. The only one that I thought shined in there, and I, I don't want to go off topic, was the Scarlet Witch part because we had never yes. seen her do yes. anything, and her lifting up Thanos, and then I was like, that's... going, "Why has she been up there?" I was <laughs> like, "I was like, this is what we've been waiting for." But that's it, really. I, oh I don't... God. Okay, I know off the top of it. Still, one of one of the great badass lines in movies when Thanos is like, "I don't even know who you are." You will. I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. I was like, that's a great moment. Okay, sorry. What's next? Um, uh, uh, Scotty Hale says, this was the last movie I got to see with my dad before he oh. passed away. He was the bi biggest Tolkien fan, and the ending was one of the few times I saw my dad cry. Oh. I can't wait to experience this with my son. Dude, that is beautiful. And it, it reminds me of a line from the off offer. There's a, there's a moment in the offer that, that's on Paramount right now where Miles Teller is talking to the, the, the girl, his girlfriend at, at the date, and he's talking about the magic of movies. And he said, I never saw my mom cry except at the movies. And that's the power of movies, man. That's the power of storytelling. It's, it's the power about why it's kind of taken me on the life path that I've been in. It's, yeah. it's that ability of movies to do that. And this is, of course, one of the crowning achievements of that magic and what a great amazing special memory you get to hold on to and it'll make it even all the more special when you watch it with your son yeah i mean that's incredible that's a, that's a beautiful thing thanks for sharing that with us because man. these movies hold up too yeah you know what they, i mean yeah and your son you're will not, be able to show it to his son yeah your I mean, son's not gonna thing. go i've seen better no no <laughs> he's gonna be it. like <laughs> what <laughs> all right what's next uh, the next was uh, Mickey Veach comes back to say, I got to go to New Zealand about 10 years ago. Nice. And even went to the planes that the Pelennor Fields was modeled after. It's as breathtaking as the movie makes it. I can honestly tell you with 100% fact, no hyperbole. I have never spoken to anybody who hasn't visited New Zealand and didn't go to one of the sets of Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> I've, I've, I've never, I, and I know seven, eight, nine people who have gone and visited New Zealand at some point, every single one of them has either gone to the Shire or to where uh, Ro Ro Rohan was was uh, shot, that little hill where they yeah. built the little city. Everybody right, who goes to New Zealand it, goes and visits Isn't that, that where Weta is located to? Like the yep. Weta workshop? They're in Wellington. Like yep. Oh, yep. They're yeah. in Wellington, New Zealand. That's great. All right, what's next? Uh, Jadrian Spivey says, the best line, in my opinion, Gandalf's speech to Mary the white shores and mm. beyond. Yeah, well, I was just talking about that a minute ago. That. that is a beautiful, you know what's really especially gorgeous about the, how well-crafted that is? It's in the midst of a chaotic, yep. bloody battle that this, this moment, this isolated moment of tenderness happens. It's, it's just, again, one of the reasons why this is one of the best damn movies that's ever been made. No argument for me. Oh, all right, and what's next? Uh, Suthius sends in a super chat. Just Thank to be you, supportive. Suthius, and is that it? And guys, we've come to the end of this installment of Movie Club talking about, and not just Movie Club, but a trilogy of Movie Clubs talking about the Lord of the Rings films. We've come to the end now discussing Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Guys, thank all of you so much for being with us here, not just for today, but this three episode journey we've been on as we've <laughs> talked about Lord of the Rings. A big special thank you to all you guys who sent in the Super Chats, number one, because you gave us great food for thought talking about Lord of the Rings Return of the King, but also you supported our channel as you did it. So thank you guys so much for supporting this content. Uh, Rob, end of the journey here for us. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, well, I, I'm in the Gray Havens now. I've moved <laughs> there. Uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram at rmburnett, and you can find me on Twitter at burnettrm, or find me on my own uh, YouTube channel, Post Geek Singularity, but mostly here. And uh, Ray Aura, the end of the three longest movies you'll ever have to watch for Movie Club. But uh, where can people find you? Oh, I, let me say something really, really quick. Like, Everything we've watched on Movie Club, there's like some sense of appreciation I have for everything we have watched. I mean, really, I mean, this, I, I mean this. There's an appreciation that I get from these movies rewatching them, and so I'm glad that this is here. But you can find me at Ray Aura with a zero. 
And a big thanks, of course, to producer Jonathan Voiko for running the show here today. Guys, we will be back again for Movie Club next week. I, I've got an idea what I want Movie Club to be on next week, but we'll, we'll announce it tomorrow on the show. Anyway, guys, that'll do it for us for now. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campion. Until next time, my friends, bye-bye.